Good morning. Welcome to Money Matters to God Saturday. Money Matters to God Saturday. This is Sean Isaacs. The subject today is please don't rob God. Please don't rob God. If you were with me a few weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, I started this, which should be a four-part series dealing with robbing God, ways in which you and I rob God. We rob God in the area of time. We rob God in relation to our temple. We rob God with our treasures and talents. And so I'm going to seek to deal with the temple today, today, this morning, the temple, meaning our bodies. And uh, again, welcome to Money Matters to God Saturday. And you say, well, what does the body, taking care of the body, what does that have to do with robbing God? Well, our bodies affect our ability to make money. Our bodies affect our ability to earn. And so anything and everything that deals with God is always dealing with the whole man, the whole woman. And so I'm going to be dealing with this topic or subject this morning. So uh, I hope that you'll be blessed. Good morning, Kevin. Good morning, Doris. Uh, Monique, it's good to see you this morning. Uh, a lot of Christians, um, there's, there's tension, right? We tend to be, have extreme views in regard to money. Sometimes money is an idol, and other times we don't pursue um, value, money enough. And so the goal of Money Matters to God Saturday is to put money in its rightful place based on the scriptures. Maybe you don't know this, but money actually is dealt with in the Bible more than 2,500 times. The idea of stewardship, finances, investments, giving, spending, um, saving, all of this is dealt with in the scriptures. And the Bible says where our treasures are, that's where our heart is. In other words, taking the broader idea of treasure beyond just that which is physical or financial, Take it to the realm of that which is important to us, that which we treasure, that which we value, shows where our heart is. So, money matters to God. I'm going to play a little bit of double-edged music, and then I will, um, I'll get started this morning. And though our ancient foe will seek to work us woe, his craft and power are great, and he's all we crew will hate. If we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You may ask who that may be. Christ Jesus is his name. This song is about the armor of God. Praying always with supplication and prayer for the saints to be bold and the strength to persevere. But the battle will not cease, though the war has been won by the blood of God's only Son. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every imagination that exalted itself against His word. That exalted itself against God. Amen. That's a good song. You know what? Since that was so good a reminder, I'm going to play one more thing, a little bit of something else. This song is called Guard Your Heart. You and I need to guard our hearts. And the way we guard our hearts, we guard what we see, we guard what we hear, we guard who we spend time with, because bad communications corrupt good manners. And so this song is called Guard Your Heart. My brother and I wrote this maybe about 15 years ago. The heart's deceitful, wicked above all things, so filled with evil, and all that is unclean. But Jesus shed his blood to cleanse you from your sin. 
He's given you a new heart. And now you're born again. Guard your heart. Guard your mind. How you live. And what you say. Things you hear. Who you're with. What you say and what you do. Somebody's watching you. Listen, because of this you have a great responsibility. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and live as one made free. Renew your mind, to this world be not conformed. Be a living sacrifice, embracing what is right. Guard your heart, guard your mind. Things you hear, who you're with, who you're with, what you see and what you do, somebody's watching you. You should strive to, I don't even remember the words now. Wow, I don't remember the words. Your mind, your strength and soul, as you race to reach your goal. You should always live like somebody's watching you. You should always live like you should always live like what you see and what you do. Somebody's watching you. Music is powerful. By the way, tomorrow is Music Matters to God Sunday. Today is Money Matters to God Saturday. But music creates an environment. Music, the right type of music, invites the presence of God in your midst. I hope you love music. I hope you have good music. I hope you listen to music. I hope you sing music. Because music is something God is very passionate about. And there's a lot of singing going on in heaven according to the word of God. So anyway, that song is called Guard Your Heart. What you and I see, what we do, somebody's watching, somebody's watching you. Great song. Anyway, welcome to Money Matters to God Saturday. Money Matters to God Saturday. And my goal with every Saturday with these devotionals, I'll call them that, is to help us to continue to look at how, how God sees money. Many of God's people are struggling financially, and a lot of it has to do with how we see money. Many of God's people are unable to get ahead, even though we have lots of declarations, lots of affirmations, and all these things that are going on. You know, you can think yourself into positivity, but that doesn't mean your life is going to change because faith without works, Scripture says, is dead. And so there are dead works, and then there are living works. There are good works. Now, sometimes when God's people talk about works, in our effort to de-emphasize works and emphasize the fact that we are saved by grace, we go so far in emphasizing grace that we somehow believe that to be saved by grace through faith means now that there are no works involved. And that's not biblical. The Bible says faith without works is dead. So true faith has living works to it. See, the thing that God condemns in the Bible is not works. What God condemns are works that are not by faith. The Bible calls those dead works. Hebrews chapter 6 says we are to move on to a place of maturity from the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ. There is a doctrine of Christ. There are six elementary teachings related to that doctrine. The first one is repentance, not just repentance in general, but repentance from dead works. Secondly, faith toward God. Then the doctrines of baptisms, laying on of hands, and so on and so on. So from God's perspective, repentance from dead works is an elementary principle. It is not works that God condemns. It is dead works that God condemns. Why is this important? Because a lot of times our view of money, our view of scripture, our view of God's blessings makes us believe that we are entitled to something because we're God's people. 
And so when you believe you are entitled, when you feel you are entitled, you get easily discouraged when things get hard. Let me say it again. When you believe you are entitled to something, you get easily discouraged when things get hard. When you understand that everything in this life that you and I take or possess requires work, requires effort, then we're not discouraged by difficulty. We're not discouraged by obstacles. We don't faint or quit in the day of adversity. We continue to persevere. Why? Because we understand but that by the sweat of our brow, we eat bread. We understand that that which costs nothing is worth nothing. We understand that even though God has promised his people blessings, even financial blessings, since that's what we're talking about, those blessings don't come without work and effort on our part. Because everything that God does uh, has a means. Everything that God does has a means to an end. And so God will give us the promise, which is the end or the goal, but there are means to accomplish it. God is sovereign. You and I are responsible. So we are the means often that God will use to accomplish that which he has promised or declared. Example, Joshua 1. God says to Joshua, every place that you tread, everywhere that your feet walks, past tense, I have already given it to you, Josh. Josh, he calls him Josh. For short. But you understand if you read the book of Joshua that Joshua didn't receive anything from God without effort on Joshua's part. Joshua didn't just stand and wait for God to provide the land of Canaan. Joshua had to apply effort. Joshua had, Joshua had to fight in a battle and he had to kill the Ites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Hivites. And on and on and on, right? And so even though God had given Joshua the land and the children of Israel the land, they had to take what God had given, which required faith. And faith without works is dead. And so we know that they had faith by their works. This is why Hebrews 11 gives us the, the heroes of faith. And it lists all the people who were not saved without works. They were saved by living works or works of faith. Rahab was saved because she hid the spies. Moses was saved because Moses chose not to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, but by faith he denied that and he pursued God. Abraham was saved because he believed God. Well, how do we know Abraham believed God? Because Abraham was not willing to keep back his son from God. And so in this temperature in our world, Christian, Christianity or Christendom, where we have a tendency to, be, to go to extreme on certain teachings, make sure that you don't overemphasize the grace of God to, and the favor of God and the kindness of God and the love of God to the degree that it takes all the demands off of you and me. And it sounds like this. People say things like, it doesn't cost anything to be a Christian. Really? Ask Peter what it cost him. He was crucified upside down. It doesn't cost anything to be a Christian. Ask John the Revelator who was boiled and then, and then banished to the Isle of Patmos for his faith in Christ. It doesn't cost anything to be a Christian. Really? Ask Peter who they took hooks and, 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 uh, and um, uh, put hooks into Peter and dragged him through the streets of the city. It costs everything to be a Christian. It costs Christ everything, and it costs you and I everything, because we're to give up ourselves to him. So anyway, what does all this have to do with our topic this morning? Well, everything is related, if you know how to relate it. I didn't intend to share what I did, but it's all related, because today we're going to talk about the way we rob God with our temple, our temple, our bodies, our bodies, right? And so... Uh, about two weeks ago, I began something called, Please Don't Rob God. Now, normally, when we hear rob God, our minds in general, I think, tend to go to the idea of money. Money, right? Money. Money is the way that the Christian robs God. Well, that's one way that we rob God. We rob God in relation to treasures. But last time we were together, we dealt with, the way we rob God is with time. Time. And if you miss that, um, I would encourage you to just use the hashtag in Google, hashtag Money Matters to God Saturday, 
and you'll find it. It's placed in YouTube. I would also encourage you, if you are blessed in any form or in any way by some of the things that I'm sharing, make sure you subscribe to the Live Recession Proof Now YouTube channel. Because at some point, I tend to, I usually upload all of these videos or have someone on my team upload all of these videos to YouTube. All right, so Money Matters to God Saturday. My goal with this is to teach God's people how to live recession proof now. Every Saturday, the goal is to teach us how to glorify God through industry and enterprise. And the way we do that is we live on less than we make, we responsibly pay off our debts, we produce multiple streams of income. One income is not wise living in America. Now, if you lived in a poor third world country, that's a different issue. But I believe everyone that lives in America should have more than one stream of income if they are a child of God. The Proverbs 31 woman had many streams of income. Just read Proverbs 31. You'll see that she bought land, she was an investor, she made clothes, and on and on and on. She, was, she purchased fields, she understood how to redeem time and how to use all that she was to bring glory and honor to God. That, that is, in my mind, to put God on display. To cause people to ask questions about our faith. Not just about our spiritual life. See, this again is what happens with us as God's people. When we think of glorifying God, there's a tendency for some to only think about our spiritual relationship, meaning our church life. Well, you can put God on display by your education, by your academics. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were ten times wiser than everyone else around them, and it costs caused caused the world to come to them for wisdom there was a time when the world used to come to the church for wisdom when presidents came to the pastors for insight and wisdom when the leaders of countries went to prophets to know what to do like elijah and elijah we don't see much of that as much of that today if it is happening i'm not aware of it but part of that is we tend to compartmentalize our lives and people don't see that God's people can be wiser in all areas. I don't think it's a coincidence that, that there are more Nobel Peace Prize winner, winners per capita among the Jewish community than any other community. As far as scientists, as far as philanthropists, as far as income generators, when you take the population of the Jewish community making up less than 1% of the world's population, less than 3% of the U.S. population. You look at their blessings monetarily, scientifically, academically, educationally, compared to the rest of the world, it, it cannot even be compared. I don't believe that's just related to the fact that God said that they would be the head and not the tail, or that God said to Abraham, through you, all the nations would be blessed, because that promise Genesis 12 through 15 is tied in Galatians to Christ, who is the seed. I do believe, though, that because they have learned from the Torah, from the Tanakh, from the Old Testament, and they have followed much of what that says in principle, though not all of them are orthodox in their views, that they get to reap the benefits. So anyway, now I have done with my rant. Let's talk about how we rob God with our temple, our temple, our temple. Please don't rob God. Let me begin with prayer. Again, as you can tell, if you know me at all, my mind is filled with a lot of information. And one of the hardest things for me to do is to tie it all, is to, is to slow my mind down. Because for me, everything is connected. And I have a tendency to try to pull it all together. And depending on the way you learn, for some people, it's so scattered, they can't receive it. Others, it's like a buffet. They're like, keep it coming. And so, since I understand that people are all wired differently, uh, differently, I need God's wisdom to to be able to stay focused, right, and stay on topic. And my wife is always reminding me. She's like, you are all over the place, and uh, that's just how my mind works. Okay. Uh, anyway, what I say to her is, a prophet's without honor in his own home. Yeah. So you can always find a scripture to help justify and keep things the way you want it to be. Anyway, uh, Doris, good to see you. Kimberly, good to see you guys. Uh, I want to begin with prayer. Father, Lord, I humbly bow before you, knowing that you are the Lord God, 
of all creation. You're the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. You are a covenant-keeping God, one who is faithful to your promises. Oh God, this morning I have one desire, and that is to put you on display. That is to make your name famous, Lord, to magnify who and what you are in the eyes and in the ears of those who will be exposed to this information. Holy Spirit of God, I'm asking you to fill me. Father, I'm asking you to baptize me afresh in the power of the Holy Ghost. May the anointing of your Spirit rest upon me, that it can be said of me that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for you have anointed me, Lord, to speak. I pray that the words that I speak would be spirit and life. Father, you know who needs to hear these words. My prayer is that your, your name would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today I'm going to talk about robbing God with our bodies. Why is our bodies important? Why is the temple important? Because, because the way we serve God is directly related to our, the way we take care of our physical bodies. Or his body, because we're just stewards. And when the Bible says that the body, our bodies belong to the Lord, it, it's not the idea of ownership alone. It's more importantly focused on the fact that he inhabits our bodies. So he has taken possession of who we are, and uh, we'll come back to that idea. So four ways in which we rob God. We rob God with time. We dealt with that. Last time, and again, if you're just coming on and, you're, and, and something here resonates with you and, and it's a blessing to you, then I would encourage you to hashtag, look up the hashtag, Money Matters to God Saturday, and you'll see the previous episodes. I've only done three, I think, before this one. So you and I rob God. Now, the idea of robbing God comes from Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, let me read that text to you real quickly. Uh, Malachi 3... Uh, God says to, um, to his people there in Malachi 3, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed you? So the children of Israel, like you and I today, if God was to say that we are robbing him, uh, we're not going to, most children of God are not going to rob God uh, consciously and intentionally. You know, we desire to please God. We desire to do his will. We want we want God to be pleased with our works, with our attitudes, with our thoughts, if we're true children of God. But sometimes we can be blinded to how God sees. And for the children of Israel, they were blinded to how God see. Have you ever heard someone say that, don't judge me, God looks at the heart and not the, God doesn't look at us physically, but the heart? And generally the way that is used, it's sort of used like that's a, a virtuous thing. That's a good thing that God looks at the heart. And so you are looking at my actions, but God looks at my heart. And I say, no, that's a scary thing. <clears throat> because the Bible says out of the heart flows evil thoughts. And, and it gives the list of all these sins that flow from the heart. And so the, I, the fact that God sees the heart can be and is often a scary thing. Because often the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. We can be deceived by our own hearts. And in the case of Israel, they were often deceived by their own hearts. So God would say things like, you draw near to me with your mouth, but your heart is far from me. Because it's possible to do the right actions, but the heart not be engaged with those actions. And if that's the case, as far as God is concerned, and you and I probably would do the same, would think the same, if the heart is not involved with the actions, the actions become nullified from God's perspective. That's how I am with my own children. If my children do the actions, but their heart is not involved or engaged, or they're murmuring under their breath, or they're complaining, the actions lose their value. And so God is always concerned about the heart. And here, the children of Israel in Malachi 3 are being rebuked by the prophet, by God through the prophet, because they had robbed God in relation to treasures, in tithes and in offerings. And they were asking the question, how and in, in what way have we robbed God? We are good religious people. We are seeking to please and honor God. How can you say that we rob God? And then God says, yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed you? And God says, you've robbed me in tithes and in offerings. 
giving the implication that God owns everything and we are to be reminded on a regular basis that God owns everything by giving to God tithes and offerings. I believe that's one of the reasons, by the way, for the tithe. Personally, I believe part of the reason for the tithe is that it is a weekly reminder that everything I have comes from God. And so, today I want to look at the way we rob God with our temple. Now by temple, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, the Bible says that we are the temple of God, referring to the child of God. The child of God is the temple of God. And when I refer to the temple, when the scriptures refer to the temple, it's referring in general to the body of Christ in general, but more specifically to our bodies, which is where God lives and resides if we're children of God. In 1 Corinthians 6, it says in verse 19, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? The Apostle Paul, in seeking to challenge and encourage and, and motivate the Corinthians to live sexually pure, begins with the motivation or the reminder that they are owned by God and God lives within them. And since God possesses their bodies and he inhabits their bodies, they were to use their bodies to bring glory and honor to God. And then it says in verse 24, you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Glorify God in, our, in your body. That's the purpose of our talk today. So my question, I'm going to focus on three things in relations in which we, in ways in which you and I rob God. We can rob God in relation to our bodies with, in the area of natural and or personal care, in spiritual care, and in physical care. Natural or personal care, spiritual care, and physical care. I'm going to begin with physical care. I'm going to begin with physical care. Physical care. Why physical care? Because physical care has to do with how we take care of our bodies, nutritionally and with activity. In order to maintain a good body, which you and I are to be stewards of, God expects us to take care of that which he has purchased for his own use. I have watched many of God's people die young, I'm going to say die before their time, even though many of God's people believe it's impossible to die before our time because our days are numbered, right? There is a day of numbering. God has numbered our days. And you go to passages in the Old Testament where all our days are written in a book. And yet the same Bible says, why will a man die before his time? The scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that there were people who partake of, partook of the Lord's table unworthily and some of them were sleeping or asleep. In the Old English or Authorized Version, to be asleep there means to be dead. And that dead was a judgment of God. Now to say that they didn't die before their time I think would miss the weight of the text, which says we should not partake of the Lord's table unworthily. And this is what I mean often when I say the word of God is filled with tension. See, from God's perspective, our days are numbered because God doesn't live in time. God lives in eternity. There is no time for God. Past, present, and future is all one, one view for God. There is no past, there is no present, there is no future from God's perspective because God knows all things and time does not exist for God. And so sometimes when we read the scriptures, we see things from God's perspective and then sometimes the Bible gives us things from our perspective. I believe it's possible to die before our time. I don't believe it was God's desire that Cain would kill his, ba his brother Abel and his brother Abel would die when he did. Why is Abel's blood still crying out to God, according to the book of Hebrews? His blood is still speaking. The first man murdered, thousands of years later, his blood is still crying out to God for vengeance. Because he was murdered innocently. So again, you could do all the gymnastics 
theologically that you want. Uh, you can choose to fit everything in a nice system or systematic theology where everything fits together, which we like things to be comfortable. Uh, and if that's what you want to do, that's fine. What I choose to do is I allow the Bible to be filled with tension so that it forces me to have to submit to the truth of Scripture and say, you know what, I can't fit it all together. And no, I don't understand how it all works. What I do understand is that God says that man's days are numbered. What I do understand is that God also says in Ecclesiastes, why will you die before your time? And I believe there are other passages that says what we sow, we reap. And so if you, if you drink gasoline every day and that kills you, you can't say, well, it was God's will that I died young. I mean, you can say that. I just don't think it fits logically with how the Bible is put together. And so I want to begin with this idea of physical because a lot of times God's people tend to, we tend to not think the physical is important. And we say things like, we go to passages like, uh, let's see, Timothy. Let's see, I think it says bodily exercise is profitable for little. But um, let's see, bodily exercise. I think that's, let's, let me see if I can find that. Give me a second. 1 Timothy 4.8 says, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. You know what some have done with this text? What some have done with this text is say, Bodily exercise profits not at all. That's not what it says. The point that's being made is bodily exercise profits little when compared to spiritual exercises. When it when compares to eternity. How many people, how many of God's people die young of diabetes, unnecessary terminal diseases, uh, uh, high blood pressure, and so on and so on? Why? Why? It doesn't have to be this way. And again, I'm not knocking or condemning anyone. What I am saying is we are to glorify God in our bodies. Our bodies is a temple. One writer on this in the 1800s says this. He says, we need to watch over all our habits so as to keep the body in the fittest state possible to do God's will. This is the highest object of health that the members may be instruments of righteousness unto holiness. Members there meaning our bodily Hearts, our hands, our feet, our heart, our ears, our eyes. That's our bodily members. And so the way we take care of our bodies is through activity. That could be exercise. That could be walking. That could be, you know, don't stay seated all the time. Stay active. That's critical. It's important to health. And through nutrition. You don't think nutrition is important? If nutrition is not important, important from God's perspective, why is so much of the Old Testament filled with dietary laws? Was God just giving them dietary laws for the purpose of being a taskmaster? Or was this the means that God would use to fulfill Exodus 15, 26, where he said that God would not put any of the diseases that were on the Egyptians upon his people? How would God not put those diseases upon them? Is it possible that one of the ways God was not going to do that is he was going to teach them what foods to eat, what foods to avoid, so that they could stay healthy? Listen to Exodus 15, 26. And, said, if God, and God says, If thou will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you. Notice that now. This, there's a couple ways to interpret this. You can interpret this by saying the benefit, if you just obey me, I'll keep you healthy. Or you can interpret this, and I believe that's part of it. Or you can interpret this, and again, this is for the children of Israel. Some of you have a problem when you start thinking of the new covenant. But stay with me. Or you could say, if you follow the statutes that I've given you, don't eat pork, don't eat this and that, don't eat unclean foods, avoid this and avoid that, and so on. That if you follow those things, I will put none of these diseases upon you. I believe that's also true. Listen to it again. If thou will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, that's number one. Number two, if you will... And do that which is right in his sight, 
and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. There is obedience. Keep all the things that I've said, okay? I will put none of these diseases upon, upon you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee, or I am Jehovah Rophi, or Jehovah Rapha, the Lord your healer. See, one of the ways God heals us is he doesn't just lay hands on us. He doesn't just zap us from heaven. I'm glad that God, the, the elementary principle of the laying on of hands is in Hebrews 6. That's a basic doctrine of Christ, though many don't believe in laying on of hands anymore. Many of God's people don't believe that we should lay hands on the sick. My wife had a pain in her leg this morning, and I laid hands on her and prayed. Why? Because God says, Sean, unless you become like little children, you cannot enter or see the kingdom of God. In other words, children are humble. Children are, uh, if you tell them God can do something, they believe. And so, again, my point here is, yes, I believe we should lay hands on the sick and pray for them. Does everyone recover? No, that's God's business. But I want to obey what he says. But I also believe one of the ways God strengthens us and keeps us is as we follow the principles of scripture we follow the principles of scripture you know the healthiest denomination among the people of god is the seventh day adventists maybe you didn't know that do a little bit of research the healthiest group of christians or denomination of believers in the world based on studies and data are the Seventh-day Adventists. And the, many of them follow the old laws, right? And they get condemned for being under the law. But maybe there's some principles there. Now, I don't believe we should live under the law, but I do believe all things in the Old Testament were written for our admonition. They were written for our encouragement. They were written for our comfort. They were written for our example, those are the four main reasons why they were written. Admonition, they were written for warning. God wouldn't warn us if it was impossible to experience what they did. It was written to bring comfort to us because we see how God uh, comforted them, how God dealt with them. We can receive comfort from the scriptures. It was written for our, for our um, actually, I'm not even going to try to remember the four things I told you. But you get the point. The point is, though we may not be controlled by the law under the Old Covenant, it doesn't mean that there is not benefit from understanding the principles found under the Old Covenant. See, the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. doesn't mean the law is not good. The law is good. The law is spiritual. The law has a purpose. I understand that law there, as Paul is describing in Romans 7, is the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. But there are principles throughout the Old Covenant that you and I should follow. So you and I rob God with our temple by not taking care of our physical bodies. We, when we don't take time to learn how to eat, what to eat, what to avoid. Years ago, I remember, I have a real strong godly mom. And I thank God for her. And I'm a Christian today because of her love for Christ and her zealous her prayers and fervent prayers. Um... But I remember years ago when my wife was diagnosed with cancer. Some of you heard me tell this story. When my wife was diagnosed with cancer for the first time, my family and I uh, began to educate ourselves and we changed a lot of our diet and our activities and our habits related relation to nutrition and food. And, um, and uh, we were trying to get my mom. My mom had diabetic issues and some other issues and we tried to convince her that she should change her diet and eat better. And uh, my, mother, my mother used to say, you know, listen, we're all going to die sometime uh, and would quote scriptures related to um, our days are numbered and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and so she never made any changes. And uh, she ended up getting cancer in her thyroid and uh, had to have surgery. Uh, I think it was almost like $40,000 for the surgery in Florida. And within a year, that same cancer came right back. And, uh, and then we said, Mom, see, we're telling you, yes, I don't have a problem with you having surgery. They that are sick need a physician. But just because the quote-unquote doctor solved your problem doesn't mean you should not become more responsible with how you take care of your body. 
And so uh, we began to speak and teach my mom how to eat and how to juice and what things to do and so on. And uh, I'm glad to tell you today that that's almost uh, maybe 15, uh, 16 years now, 15, 16 years. And um, that cancer never came back. Thank God. You know, and she, I talked to her just a couple days ago. She's telling me, stay away from sugar and telling me. And I'm like, Mom, I thought we, had, we were the one that, ones that uh, it brought some of this knowledge to you. My point here is the way we rob God, we rob God of the energy that could be used in his kingdom, for his glory, because we're not good stewards of our bodies. We're not good managers of our bodies. The, uh, one of my favorite hymns is the hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be. Some of you know that. The songwriter says, Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of your love. Take my feet, let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages for thee. The songwriter identifies their body as an instrument for righteousness. Their body is something that can be used to bring honor and glory to God. The lips, the voice, the hands, the eyes, the ears, the feet. But these things cannot be given with full energy, if we are always sickly, if we are always weak, right? And so Paul says, I labor more than them all, yet not I. It was the grace of God that was with me. Not to condemn anyone, but sometimes we can't labor as much as God desires us to because we're not getting proper rest. That's not taking care of the body. We're not getting enough sleep. We're not getting proper nutrition, and it's not what you eat that matters, it's what we digest that matters. And so on and so on. And so, again, what does this have to do with money matters to God? Well, we need our energy, we need our bodies to be able to earn revenue. We need our mind to be sharp to know how to invest the resources that God gives us, how to spend and on and on. You can make the connection. In other words, you cannot separate anything that we do from our bodies. And God says we should glorify God in our bodies and spirits, which are His. What's another way that we rob God in relation to our bodies? What about in natural and or personal care? Natural and personal care. Do you know the Bible is very concerned about hygiene and personal care? God talks about, in the Bible, about leprosy. You know, God talks about, you know, avoid those who have leprosy. Why? Don't touch the unclean, because it's going to make you unclean. God told Samson, I don't want you to touch, you're going to have a Nazarite vow. You're not to touch dead bodies. Why? Because that's going to make you unclean. God is very concerned about hygiene. In the book of Exodus, uh, God tells the children of Israel, when they were to come up to the mountain, that they were to... First thing they were to do was to clean their clothes. You say, what? Clean your clothes? What in the world does that have to do with, with coming before God for worship? See, all these things are related in God's mind. Um, the Bible says in Exodus 19, listen to this. <clears throat> 19 verse 14, And Moses went down from the mountain unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. You say, what in the world does that have to do? Well, that was part of sanctifying themselves unto God. In the New Testament, and under Jewish law, you see this throughout the Old Testament, they would have washed their hands. Why would they have washed their hands? Now, they made what God had commanded so much of a tradition that it lost its value. But God was still concerned about hygiene. God was still concerned about cleansiness, clean, cleanliness. God is a God, a God of order. And so one of the ways that you and I glorify God in our bodies is by natural and personal care. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. If you're okay with smelling... If you're okay with all that type of stuff and you don't have a personal desire to have good hygiene, then that's on, that's on you, right? That's on you. I'm not even going to, that's, I think you don't even have to be a Christian to know that that's important. But I'm only using the Bible to show that you may think that this is just a natural thing. There's nothing natural when it comes to God's world because anything that is 
true and that is orderly flows out of the character of God, right? And so though we may not have a direct command in Scripture, we can see the principles of Scripture that undergird these things. The last thing is spiritual care, spiritual care of our bodies. So there's physical care of our bodies, natural care of our bodies, and then uh, we tend to rob God with our physical, our spiritual care of our bodies. Now in the text in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul was dealing with sexual sin among the Corinthians, and he admonished them by saying they were to glorify God in their bodies and their spirits, which are God's. Well, you and I should, be jeal- should jealously watch over our bodies, not to allow our bodies to be polluted with sin. Why do we not want our bodies to be polluted with sin? Because if our bodies become polluted with sin, it affects our worship to God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7 says that we should, should, should cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Why should we do that? Because God has called us to himself, he calls us his children, and our worship is more pure and acceptable when it comes from clean vessels. And so uh, the probably most familiar text of Scripture in relation to giving our bodies to God, which belong to him anyway, is Romans 12, right? You know this, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. Notice the word, holy. So much here that we can spend time thinking about, but God says we're to present our bodies. To present something is like an act of worship. It's like, God, here's my body, use it for your glory. And so, Paul says, looking at the first 11 chapters of Romans, that's described as the mercies of God. Look at all that God has done for you. We've been justified by faith. We have the grace of God. Where sin abounds, grace is much more abounding. And it goes through all of these things. We have been, uh, uh, Christ has become the righteousness of God to those of us who belong to God. And so we have all these mercies that have been shown and given to us. And Paul says, it is only reasonable that if you are conscious that God has been merciful to you, that you should, at least you and I should do is give God our bodies. Now, I don't know if you understand the principle of first fruits, but the principle of first fruits, I think uh, Proverbs 3, verse 10, that we should give God the first of all of our increase, that's a principle. Not just for money, not just for tithing. I believe we should give God the best of who and what we are. This is why I believe we should give God the first part of our mornings in prayer and reading and devotion. To rob God, the idea is to deprive of something due, something expected, something desired. That's Webster's Dictionary. And when you think of Scripture, God commands us to give Him the best. Titus 2.14 says, We should be zealous for good deeds. Colossians 1.10 says, Walk in a manner that's worthy of the Lord, pleasing Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work. Romans 12, 11 says that we should not lag in diligence, but we should be fervent in spirit. In other words, there should be a sense of zeal, a sense of energy given to what we do for God, give to God. And that idea is the idea of giving God our best. Don't give God leftovers. In the Old Testament, if they gave God a, 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 a lamb that was lame or that was blind or that was um, um, sickly, God didn't accept the sacrifice. It was not a good sacrifice because it didn't give God the best. And I believe the principle is the same. That when you are preparing for church on Sunday, you don't stay up until 3 a.m. so that you can't be alert when you get to the house of God tomorrow. That's not wise. That's not being a living sacrifice. That's not giving God the best. And we can take that principle and broaden it to the rest of our life. And so this text says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, number one, as a living sacrifice. An old preacher, Leonard Ravenhill, says 
The problem with a living sacrifice is that it can get up off the altar. That's the problem with a living sacrifice. God wants us to give him, not a dead sacrifice. I'm glad that we can give him our bodies and we can choose what we want to do with our bodies. And so God says, present it to me. Present it to me as a gift. Present it to me as an offering. Present it to me as a free will offering. It's a choice to present it. But it must be a living sacrifice. And since it is a living sacrifice, this presenting has to be done on a regular basis. The tense here is over and over. We don't present the sacrifice to God once. Our bodies, we don't give it to him once. Because every day we're challenged in what we're going to do with our bodies. Am I going to choose to yield to sin? Am I going to choose to, lead, to yield to righteousness? Romans 6. So we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Secondly, holy. Holy. Our body should be given to God as holy. Why? Because if it's set apart to God, our worship now is more pure and acceptable to God. And then it says, holy, acceptable unto God. If it's not set apart, if it's not holy, if it's not a living sacrifice, then it's not acceptable. Which is our reasonable service. And so, we tend to rob God at times with our bodies by not being aware and conscious of the natural and personal care of our bodies, of the need for physical care of our bodies, which deals with nu nutritionally and, and through activity. And the act activity, you know, we call it exercise today, but it doesn't have to be in a gym to have activity. You know, uh, you could do jumping jacks. Do 100 jump, jumping jacks every day. That's one of my practices. Maybe do 100 push-ups every day. Maybe when you start out, you can only do two. But if you add every day, you'll be shocked what you can do over time. Have physical activity. It's important. Physical activity is so, so important to have energy. You know, I look at a lot of the elderly today. I don't knock the elderly. I'm not condemning. I'm not any of that. I want to be very careful with what I say. But... I look at how hard it is, how difficult it is, how challenging it is. My wife and I went out to eat for breakfast in a diner yesterday, and a lot of the people were, you know, older. I don't know their ages, but a lot of devices to walk and so on and so on. And again, I'm not saying that we don't get old, but if you were to study some other cultures, there are people, I watched a video the day before yesterday of a 100-year-old and a 102-year-old that broke world records in running. The 60-yard dash. And I looked at that 100-year-old and the 102-year-old. The 102-year-old was a woman. She broke the world record for the fastest woman over 100. And, and there was like five or six women, by the way, in this race. And then there was a 100-year-old man, and there was like six men in that race. They didn't have a cane. They didn't have a walking stick. They didn't have one of those pusher things. And again, I'm not knocking anybody like that. But if you are younger today and still have your physical health, remember what we sow, we reap. You can't drink Coca-Cola every day, eat McDonald's every day, eat bad food and bad nutrition, no activity, and not reap it in your 50s or 60s or 70s. Why should God get blamed for our bad habits? And a lot of God's people do this. Well, God has ordained this. No, stop blaming God. What we sow, we reap. And again, I'm not trying to figure it all out. That God can ordain all things and work all things after the counsel of his own will. And yet, I reap what I sow. We don't blame God, hopefully, for sin. When we sin and we reap the consequences. I don't think no one is saying God predestined for Bill Cosby to be going to prison in the sense that God is the one that made him sin in the way that he did so that he can reap the consequences. I wouldn't say that. James says that's accusing God of evil. What I would say is God has structured his laws just like the law of gravity that whatever we sow, we're going to reap. And I believe physically that happens as well. So again, uh, I hope no one takes this the wrong way. I'm not trying to condemn anybody that's struggling with health and other issues. You know, my wife has had a lot of health issues over the years. And what we have tried to do is learn from her experiences so that we can be wiser in how we take care of ourselves, our bodies, and bring honor and glory to God. The scripture says, whatever we do, 
Whether we eat or drink, we should do all to the glory of God. God expects me to eat in a way and drink in a way that puts him on display, that makes him famous, that glorifies him. That's a spiritual action. Scripture again says, bodily exercise profiteth little. It doesn't say it doesn't profit at all. Compared to eternity, there's little profit if you just spend time working out in the gym, taking care of your body, and creating Snapchat videos and Instagram posts. There are women and men who have created million-dollar careers worshiping their bodies. I wouldn't say worship. I'll say taking care of their bodies. Right? Let's soften it. They have focused on their bodies. And I say, great. Great. But they've not focused on their souls. Scripture says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose your soul? So what? You have a great body for 95 years. Awesome. Jacqueline did 90 plus years. If you don't know God, then that bodily exercise profits little. Again, this is Money Matters to God Saturday. If you're just coming in later on, what does taking care of our body have to do with money? Well, there's four main ways that I think we rob God. We rob God in time, treasures, talents, and with our temple. Trying to stay close with just keeping T so we can remember. That's why I use the word temple. Temple in scripture deals with our bodies, our physical bodies. Well, again, all this relates because the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual state that you, are, you and I are in has everything to do with how we handle and how we generate or create treasures. All right? So, Gary, good, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, Trevor, all the way in the Bahamas. Are you still in the Bahamas, Trevor, or are you living somewhere in New York somewhere? Anyway, God bless you guys. Trevor, um, message me. Um, we may have some music stuff coming up. I'd love to get you involved. You guys have a great day. Again, this is Money Matters to God Saturday. If anything here resonated with you and you would like to um, connect with some of the other videos I've done on this topic of money, just use the hashtag Money Matters to God Saturday. If you're new to my Facebook Live videos, uh, every day I do a daily nuggets of wisdom, Monday through Friday. Saturday is Money Matters to God Saturday, and Sunday is Music Matters to God Sunday. Be blessed, guys. Have a good day, and uh, I hope you found something here profitable. God bless. Bye.